Good morning, boys and girls. Hang on. How we doing? Hey, rejoice, Brother John's back. Woohoo! How many of you never knew I was gone? Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, we are. Sue and I are fresh back from vacation, and it's glad we're glad to be in worship with you today. Uh, so first thing I want to do is say welcome to everyone. If this, your, if this is your first time to be with us or maybe one of the few uh, first visits that you've had with us, we'd love to connect with you. The easiest way to do that is right on your phone. Uh, FirstDenton.Church is kind of an online bulletin, and there's all kinds of helpful things there. Uh, sermon notes, prayer requests. Uh, you can find a link there to our main website. Just all the information that you need is right there at your fingertips. Uh, leave some information about yourself and your visit, and uh, we'd love to get in touch with you and see how we can get connected with you. If you want to write things down, there's a, pew, uh, a card in the pew rack in front of you uh, that you can fill that out and drop it in one of our collection boxes on your way out today. We'd appreciate it very much. This is a very special day because we want to recognize our school teachers. If you are a school teacher at any level, elementary, secondary, college, would you please stand to your feet? Yay! Yay! All right. Well, we have a gift. Stay, stay standing. Stay, stay, stay standing. We have a gift for you in these little bags here. So let me just say a couple of things while they're passing them out. Please stay, uh, remain standing until you get yours. There is money in the bag, okay? So a couple of things that means is uh, don't uh, inadvertently discard it. And number two, watch the person next to you on the pew. So, yeah, uh, uh, there's a Starbucks gift card inside there. And just, we just want you to know that we are thinking of you and we're going to have a prayer time, a dedication time for you here in just a second. Uh, if you didn't know this about Dr. Brother John, uh, my wife Sue was a public educator in Alabama for over 25 years, and then she uh, taught private school as well for nine years, so Brother John's seen it, and uh, we know that our teachers need lots and lots of prayer, and that's what I would like to do right now as we get ready to continue in our worship. Let me lead a, a prayer for our teachers. I want you to pray too, and, and just lift up your own requests on behalf of our teachers and then after that, we'll be uh, starting our music portion of our service. Let's bow our heads. God, thank you for our teachers. Every one of us have been so powerfully influenced uh, by teachers, by those who uh, educate us, but also help build our character. Uh, so, God, we thank you for that. I pray for a year that is beneficial in ways beyond what we can even think about right now. I pray for safety. I pray for courage. I pray for uh, your Holy Spirit to undergird the hearts and souls of all of those who teach and who work with our kids. God, bring a great uh, revival, uh, a determination to see that there is good and that that good is worth fighting for. And we thank you for that. We praise you for our educators. Our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We are glad that you're here. Let's worship. Y'all go ahead and stand up and let's worship the God who can take dead things and make them alive. He can take our sorrow and turn it into joy. And so as we sing this song, let's continue worshiping this morning. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures to fade are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love there's nothing oh Oh 
I have a new one here this morning we want to share with you. It's called Jesus Does, a celebration of the great mercies he shares with us. Who tells the sun to rise every morning, color the sky with shades of his glory, wakes us in mercy and love, Jesus does. the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the song. for us by giving us his only son.
worship your name freely. God, we um, pray for the teachers and the staff and the students, uh, my own kindergartner um, going to school this week, Lord. Um, just pray that they would be a light in their hallways for you, Lord, um, that you would just strengthen them, um, give them boldness and courage. Um, God, I pray for Dr. Jeff as he brings your word. I pray that you would speak through him, Lord, um, and pray that everything we do would just give you honor and glory. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.
<clears throat> Has anybody noticed it's been hot lately outside just a little bit? You know, the greatest invention ever is uh, the new Rangers ballpark that is indoors. You know, I went to the baseball game yesterday, and they make a point at the beginning of the game to say the temperature outside is 106 degrees. But here inside Globefield Park or whatever it is, it is 74 degrees. Greatest thing, greatest thing ever invented. Now, uh, some things people talk about how hot it was, okay? Uh, you may have heard some of these. One guy said it's so hot I saw a chicken lay a fried egg this week. <laughs> That one said, it's so hot, my thermometer goes all the way to, are you kidding me? Another said, it's so hot that, I like this one now. It's so hot, listen to this one, okay? It's so hot, the trees are whistling at the dogs. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Why would they do that? It's so hot, I found out my seatbelt could be used as a branding iron. Anybody ever had that happen? All right. And finally, it's so hot, I saw a dog chasing a cat, and they were both walking. <laughs> So it is. It's hot. Different terms people use, you know, to talk about the heat. You know, the, it's not the heat. It's the humidity. Uh, you know, right now it's the heat. I mean, forget about the humidity. Uh, it's a barn burner. Uh, anybody hear your grandmother say this? It's hotter than blue blazes. Hotter than blue blazes. It's hot enough to scald a lizard. That was a new one for me. And finally, it's hotter than a stolen tamale. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, it, it has been hot, uh, but it's cool in here, and we're glad you're here today. So take your Bibles. We're going to study from Psalm 91 today, the 91st Psalm. So go ahead and open your Bibles to that passage this morning. Next month, September, will mark 22 years since September the 1st, 2011, a day that literally changed our country for the rest of time, I guess you would say. It was a day much like the day Pearl Harbor was attacked, a day much like the day that President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. I mean, it's a day that if you were alive then, and I know many in this room are not, but if you were alive then, I'm sure you can tell us exactly where you were when you learned about those planes hitting the towers and other planes crashing out in the fields in Pennsylvania and at the Pentagon. I mean, it was a day that literally changed the way we see things. You know, before that day, we knew terrorism. We'd heard about it, but it was somewhere over there where it took place. It had never taken place right here on our own soil in our own country. And I really think that day our country became the land of fear instead of the land of the free because we were fearful. And some of it has faded, I know, over 20 years of time, but especially in those first few years. I mean, we had, you know, other threats come up, you know, other tax were coming, uh, a, a, a warning system was created with different levels and all, and of course, we now have a Homeland Security uh, uh, Department and all, and just a lot of things have changed. You got to take your shoes off at the airport, which is ridiculous in my mind, but, you know, just all these things because of what happened on that day. Now, I don't know what your fears are in life. I did find a, a list of the top 10 fears of Americans. You will probably won't be surprised at many of these. Fear number one is the fear of a loved one dying. We can certainly understand that. Number two, the fear of a loved one becoming seriously ill. Now, this third one I thought was kind of interesting, not really surprised. But the third greatest fear in America today is the fear of a mass shooting. I mean, with all that's happened in our country over the last... Uh, you know, a couple of years, that's not really that surprising. Number four is not having enough money for retirement. Number five is terrorism. I would imagine that back in 2001, that one was probably a little higher up on the list. Number six uh, was uh, government corruption. Number seven, becoming terminally ill. Number eight, hate crimes. Number nine, high medical bills. And finally, number 10, widespread civil unrest. Now, I don't know, maybe you would say, yeah, I've got some of those. And maybe you've got some other fears, you know, fear of heights, fear of uh, other things. Uh, whatever your fears are today, I want you to know the Bible addresses our fears, and it tells us how to deal with those fears, and especially here in Psalm 91. Uh, the writer of this psalm knew that we deal with fear in our life, and so he was trying to help us with those fears. Now, Psalm 91 is one of those orphan psalms I told you about several weeks ago. It just means we don't know who wrote it. Uh, there's some speculation about different people, but bottom line is we don't know who this person was, but they had a great grasp, I think you would say, on God and how he helps us through the fearful times of life. Now, here's what we're going to read this, this 16 verses. So we're going to read it in sections as we go along. And, and I think this psalm gives us four pillars, if you will, four pillars that we can stand on, that we can have in our lives to help us to deal with our fears. 
All right, so take your outline, take your Bibles, and let's begin with the first pillar that we see here in the first couple of verses. I'm going to call this pillar, pillar this, God is my hiding place. God is my hiding place. So take your Bible and just uh, read along with me. Chapter, or, or Psalm 91, verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. So right off the bat, he's telling us about protection. And by the way, I think the thing that the, this psalm is saying, the whole theme of this psalm uh, is simply this, uh, trusting in God. You know, in God we trust, we say. That's a motto that our country has. It's on our, our money. Uh, it's on some of our first responder cards. We've seen that lately. You know, that's kind of a mantra in our country. But we need to realize we don't trust in our government. We don't trust in our leaders. We don't trust uh, in, in all those other things. We trust in God and him alone. And that's what this writer, I think, is trying to tell us. Now, he uses four what I'm going to call security terms here in these first couple of verses. Let me just kind of give them to you, and let's think about them for a minute. Uh, the first one he gives uh, is the word shelter. He says, we have a shelter in God. And when I was a kid growing up, uh, we would go visit my great-grandparents in Ada, Oklahoma. And we didn't do it often, but I just remember going a few times as I grew up. And, but uh, it just seems to me, it's probably not true, but it seems to me that every time we went we had to go get in the storm shelter that they had out in the backyard because a tornado was coming through. And I've kind of I've told this story before too. One time we went was for my mother's cousin's wedding. Uh, and her cousin, I uh, can't even remember his name at this point. But anyway, he was getting married. And so we were there for that wedding. But the wedding was that night. Sometime that afternoon, a storm came through. So we all had to go out and get in the storm shelter. Now, I guess some brides and grooms still do this today. But, but back then, you couldn't, the bride couldn't see the groom on the wedding day, until the wedding, is bad luck, okay? We've kind of done away with that. Uh, but that was the, the thing then. And so I'll never forget, tornado's coming. Everybody's going out to get in the storm shelter. The bride got to get in the storm shelter. The groom had to stay outside because they couldn't see each other on that day. Now, as a seven-year-old, I'm thinking, I don't ever want to get married. I mean, come on now. I mean, you're blown away by a tornado. Now, but a shelter is a place we go for safety, for protection from something or from someone, God says, I want to be your shelter. All right, the second word that I would call a security term or word here is the word shadow. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't usually think about a shadow as something that would protect me. Uh, now, a shadow can't harm us. We looked at Psalm 23 last week. David said, uh, you know, even I'll go through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. So a shadow can't hurt us, but uh, he describes it this way here, the shadow of the Almighty. When you think of a shadow that way, the shadow of God, when we get in his shadow, there we can find shelter. There we can find protection. All right, the third word he uses here is the word refuge. Refuge. And I believe a refuge is a place that we go for security, a place that we go where we can be protected. You know, when we were forming our ministry center that's down at the corner of Broadway and Malone, uh, we were trying to come up with a name. You know, what are we going to call this? What are we going to call this ministry? And I remember early on, somebody said, I think the word refuge ought to be in the name because we want people to think of us and see this as a place of safety, a place of security. Then we started thinking about, okay, what else? When we thought about the word first, because we know we want them to think of this place first. When they need security, when they need help, when they need uh, something, this place first, and because First Baptist Church is the one who's creating this. And so that's how we came up with First Refuge, a place of security, a place of safety. And finally, the fourth term we see here is the term fortress. Now, you know what a fortress is? Fortress is like a castle. You know, when Tammy and I were on our river cruise a few weeks ago, uh, one day they told us, hey, today we're going to go buy a bunch of castles. And sure enough, about 20 different castles we went by over about a four or five hour period of time. And every one of them were massive deals, you know, just there up there on the hillside, up in the hills. That was a place where years ago when the battles were going on, they would go to be protected. They would go to be uh, safe from their enemies and the people that were around them. So look at those words again. Shelter, shadow, refuge, and fortress. All of those are hiding places. And God says, I want to be your hiding place. You know, my grandkids love to play hide and go seek. I mean, every time we go see them or they come here, pops, pops, can we play hide and go seek? You know how hide and go seek works. Somebody counts 
and the rest of them go and hide. Now, I learned early on that if I hide first and then I go look for them second, I know exactly where they're going to be. They're going to hide exactly where I did, you know, right before that. But you know how it works. You count to 10, then you say, ready or not, here I come. Well, that's kind of what Satan does with us. Satan is looking for us. He's trying to find us. He's trying to put fears into our lives. But unlike hide and go seek, he doesn't warn us. He doesn't say ready or not. He just comes. And he comes at us every day. And he tries to bring those fears into your life. They may have to do with your health. They may have to do with your finances. They may have to do with school coming up. Whatever it is, God says, hey, I want to be your hiding place. I love how David said it. Psalm 56. David said, Whom am I, when am I afraid? I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You know, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus points out that the worst people can do to us, the worst thing a person can do to you would be to take your life. Now, that's pretty bad. You know, that's, maybe you have a fear of that. But he reminds us, Life is not just about the physical life here on this earth. You know, if somebody were to take your life, if your physical life were to end today, and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, guess what? Uh, eternal life begins for you then, in heaven, in a place that God is preparing for all of us. So that's kind of the first pillar, is that God is our hiding place. Right? second pillar is that he, God, will protect me from danger. Now take your Bible again. Let's go back to verse 3 and read down through verse 8. He says, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. All right, so this theme continues about God protecting us, about us putting our trust in him. Now, the author here uses four different names of God. I want to show you those names this morning. Now, we'll tell you that in September of this year, we're going to start a series on the names of God. We're going to take eight or ten weeks looking at the different names the Bible has for God. So we'll go, go into detail in some of these, but let me just kind of give you a, just a thumbnail sketch. Four names that we see for God, that remind us about his protection and his helping us in dangers. Right, we're going to put them on the screen. The first one, uh, Elyon, E-L-Y-O-N. Now, this particular name means the most high, telling us God is the most high. And the idea here behind this name is that of possession, the fact that God owns everything. And if you're a child of God, if you put your faith and trust in him, he owns you. He owns everything about you. He owns me. He owns my life. He possesses us. And just knowing that uh, helps us to put our trust in him to keep us out of danger. Now, this, this name is found 36 times throughout the Bible. So it's a really pretty common name for God. All right, the second one is El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Now, those of you who are my age and older, you remember Amy Grant's song, El Shaddai. She used to sing that song. The word El Shaddai means the Almighty. The Almighty. Now, all of these have El in front of them. El Oyan, El Shaddai. Uh, we'll see the others in a minute. Uh, but this particular one, El Shaddai, talks about provision. The fact that God is not only a living God, he's also a giving God. He takes care of our everyday needs that we experience a lot. Well, number three, the third one is Jehovah. We talked about this one a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is the most common name uh, for the Hebrew people in Bible times for Jehovah, although they would not verbalize that name. It was so sacred. It was so holy. They wouldn't write it either. Uh, they came up with another. Uh, Yahweh was kind of the, the word they came up to, or Adonai, instead of saying Jehovah. But Jehovah means I am. and has the idea of promise with it. God's made a covenant with us, a covenant relationship that we have with him. And finally, the fourth one, Elohim. Elohim means God, the creator. And it's all about power, the power of God to create things. Uh, the term is, is used as uh, the Latin term, ex nihilo, out of nothing. God created everything out of nothing. He is that powerful and able to do that. Now, 2,700 times in the Bible, we find the name Elohim. But let me tell you this. Every time Elohim is in the Bible, it's always in the plural form with a singular verb. 
Now, those of you who are English people, like my wife over here, you're thinking, oh, that's horrible. That, I mean, that's bad grammar to put a plural noun with a singular verb. If I were to tell you, we is going to Torchies for lunch after church today. You know, English people just shake their heads. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe he said that. You know, that's just horrible. That's bad grammar. And it is. I agree with you, except when you're talking about God. Because when we say Elohim and he says we... He's talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is three in one. So it is correct for God to say, we is, when he talks about himself. But all of these just remind us of the power God has to protect us from the dangers of this world, the things that would draw us back and keeping us from experiencing everything that God has for us in this life. You know, back in 2001, when those towers came down, the people died in those planes. A question was asked. I think it's a very honest question. They asked, where was God when all that was happening? Where was God when those thousands of people were dying in those towers and on those airplanes? And the answer to that question then is still the same as it is 22 years later today. God was exactly where he was when his son, Jesus Christ, was dying on the cross for your sins and mine. He was right there. He was right there in those towers. He was right there on those airplanes. Now, we got other questions we want to ask. Well, why? You know, if he was there, why? Why did it happen? And I don't have answers to all that, but I do know where he was. He was right there, and he's right there with you no matter what. Sometimes we may not feel his presence. You know, it may not seem like he's there, but he's there. I read about a Native uh, American tribe that had a an unusual way of preparing their young men to be warriors. Uh, when a young boy turned 13 years of age, on his 13th birthday, they would take him out into the wilderness, and he had to stay out there by himself all night. One particular boy came his day. They blindfolded him, walked him a couple of miles into the wilderness, and left him there, told him not to take the blindfold off for one hour. So he stood there, fearful, as you can imagine, hearing all the sounds. When he finally took the blindfold off, it was one of those cloudy nights, and so there was no moon uh, shining, there was no stars shining. I mean, it was just pitch black. And now for several hours, every time he heard a twig snap, he was wondering if an animal was about to jump on him. And he would hear an animal in the, in the distance wondering if a, a wolf was about to come out and, and, and devour him. All night long he stood there, finally, to what seemed like an eternity, the first rays of sunlight began to appear. He could see the grass and the flowers and the trails there around him. And much to his surprise, just about 20 yards away, he saw a figure. It was a man standing there with a long bow and an arrow in his hand. It was his father. He had been there all night long to protect him. You know, sometimes we don't feel the presence of God. Sometimes we feel like we're all alone in this problem I'm dealing with. In this danger that I think I have. But God says, I am there with you. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties, all your fears on him because he cares for you. So the second pillar of this psalm is that he will protect me from danger. Right, the third pillar is this, his angels watch over me. Let's go back to verse 9, see what it says. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. So he's talking about his angels here. You know, part of God's uh, resources, I guess we could say, to protect us and to, to, to uh, take us through dangerous times are his angels. Now, I, I don't believe the Bible teaches that every one of us have a specific guardian angel. What I mean is, I don't think that angel number 7,595 is Mark Moffat's guardian angel, okay? And angel number 10,995 is, uh, you know, is Jeff Williams' guardian. I don't think it works that way. But I do think that a part of the angel's responsibility, a part of the angel's jobs is to protect us. Let me read to you that what I believe is the job description of angels. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those 
who are to inherit salvation. So what are angels? They are ministering spirits. They are sent out for the sake of those who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So that means you don't just have one singular guardian angel. No, God has all of his angels to protect you and to help you and to be there for you over and over and over again. Now, when I read verses 11 and 12 again, let's read it again. Look what it says. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, do those verses sound familiar to anyone from another place in the Bible? Luke chapter 4 is where Jesus is taken out in the wilderness and tempted by Satan. And Satan quotes scripture to Jesus several times. Satan quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. But as he often did, oftentimes Satan would would distort Scripture and and not quote it perfectly. But sometimes, I think he did pretty much quote it word for word here, if you look at Luke chapter 4. But he tried to use that verse in a way that God did not intend. Jesus' response to Satan was, you should not put the Lord your God to the test. Yes, he will take care of us. But we don't put ourselves in unnecessary situations to try to tempt God to protect us or not. But God's got those angels there to take care of us and to take us through uh, all the things of life. You know, one other, I think, job of angels is to escort us into heaven when we die. Luke chapter 16, I think, affirms that. And we often hear stories of people who are very near death. And they talk about seeing angels maybe at the foot of their bed or maybe angels uh, there around the ceiling uh, of, their, of their room. And nobody else can see that, but maybe, possibly, that's those angels ready to escort them up into heaven. Can I say one other thing about angels, just to remind you? You know, oftentimes we'll hear somebody say, when, when somebody dies, especially maybe a child, somebody say, well, God has another angel in heaven. And, and I, you know, I would never correct somebody at a funeral or anything like that that would say that, but I would just say to you, we don't become angels, Okay. Uh, angels are created beings. God created them in a particular way with a particular assignment to protect us, to escort us to heaven, to do all these things for us. But we don't become angels. We stay human beings uh, who go to heaven one day. But those angels are there to protect us and to keep us. Frank Peretti was a guy who wrote, wrote a couple of novels several years ago about the spiritual warfare that goes on in our world. You know, we can't see angels. We can't see demons. Uh, But in his novels, he's alluded to the fact that he believes that when we're gathered here in a worship service like this, that Satan would love to have his demons come here and disrupt things and and, and keep your mind from listening. And God's angels are there doing battle with them. And in his novels, he kind of pictures that and what it might look like to see those, maybe right even right here in this room today, doing battle against one another. Uh, Again, it's a novel. It's just his take on it. But I think he's probably got a pretty good grasp of what those angels do for us in protecting us day after day after day. All right, one last pillar, fourth pillar, is he has prepared eternity for me, for you. Let's go back to verse 14. See the last verses here. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, that last ver- word there is kind of what I want to key on for a minute. Uh, he says he's preparing our salvation. Uh, other versions say inheritance or eternity. You know, Jesus in John chapter 14 described it. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am there, you may be also. You see, I think those disciples put their trust in Jesus for eternity because of what he said to them there in that time. You know, back in 2001, uh, you know, the, the weeks and through September and October and weeks after that, we saw a lot of videos, a lot of videos that people had taken, maybe running from the buildings or, or other things. We heard a lot of audio, people, uh, you know, seeing things and, and the words they spoke. And, and if you can remember back to that over and over again, we heard people say things like, oh, my God, or oh, God. And I think that's interesting 
that people who maybe don't even follow Jesus Christ, who don't even really follow God, but in a time like that, what do they go back to? They go back to him. They go back to calling out to him. And folks, that's what we need to do. When we're fearful, we're in times of danger, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to call out to God. I don't know what you're dealing with today. I don't know what kind of troubles or situations. You know, maybe it's a financial one. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you're worried about going back to school this week or the next couple of weeks. I don't know what it is. But here's what I do know. God wants to be your shelter. He wants to be your refuge. He wants to be your strength through it all. Some say, well, you know, I just... I'm just not sure. You know, I'm just not sure about all of that. Well, one last thing. If you've got your outline there, you've got a pen, right down at the bottom of your outline, just write the word life. L-I-F-E. Okay? You got it? L-I-F-E. Now, circle the two middle letters. I-F. There's a lot of if in the middle of life, isn't there? I mean, if I get this job, then I'll be able to pay the bills. If the drugs work and my spouse is healed from cancer. You know, it's just a lot of ifs. If, 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 if. But look what's left when you take if out. L and E, which can stand for life eternal. And that's what it's all about. All the fears of this world are useless and cannot harm us if we remember that we have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's why I think this psalm is in the Bible, so that we can hold on to those pillars and know that we can deal with the fears of life because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Father, I thank you today for this psalm. Thank you for what it does. Speak to our fears. And Father, to the dangers that we encounter on this earth. But I thank you that you are greater than all of our fears and greater of all the things that might harm us and might bring us down. Father, help us to run to you, to be our refuge, to be our shelter, to be our fortress when Satan comes at us with all the fears that he does. Father, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. And Lord, I pray for any in this room, maybe in watching online today, that, that haven't taken that step of faith to put your son, Jesus Christ, in the very center of their life so that they can have life eternal pray that today, Father, you would pull on their heart, show them that need today. So thank you, Lord, for being our refuge, for being our fortress. Help us, Lord, to have the courage and the strength to rely only on you when our fears come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand up with us. We're going to close with a song today. One that you know and love confesses Jesus' care for us. Sing with me. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of the sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself?
turn. Here we go. Oh, God. Thank you, thank you. Have a seat for just one more moment. Direct your attention to the screens. Hey, that looked like fun, right? <laughs> looked like somebody needs to teach them how not to spill. I did notice that was in there. Uh, but I do want to mention one thing to you. I had a little fun with Dr. Jeff uh, because when they got there, you saw they were working on a lot of houses, right? And uh, so some folks had to get up on the roof. And so Jeff was like, oh, young, young people, that's for you, up on the roof. And they went, no, you have to be a certain age to be on the roof. <laughs> and so Jeff had to get on the roof. Now, feel sorry for them because it's about the same thing. Like, if you saw your mother up on the roof, you would not like that. So, yeah. But, brother, we're glad you survived that. I'm glad you enjoyed that ice cream, too. So, hey, wonderful. Uh, it's great to be a part of a church that has a go-and-tell aspect to it. So, congratulations to all the folks that went to uh, Puerto Rico. This was a youth-sponsored trip. So, Mr. Eric, congratulations to you and to everyone who uh, went as a sponsor and uh, the, as a young person who just went to have a missions experience. So praise the Lord for that. I have a couple of announcements for you. I brought some show and tell. This is my Rooted book. You've heard us talk about Rooted and an intense deep Bible study that we've, uh, we've already had uh, in our church. We've done several Rooted groups. I've been in a group and led a group. And uh, this is a great, great experience. It is a deep dive into the Bible. This is actually a workbook, so there's lots of places in here for you to journal your experience and things like that. But one of the things that was most important to me is that we formed kind of confessional communities and really shared our hearts and our prayer concerns. We did some mission work together. Uh, just a great, great experience. We want you to have that experience too, and that starts August the 27th. You can sign up online, firstdenton.org. Uh, check out what we have there. There are going to be groups that meet multiple days during the week. Also groups that meet in various locations. So if a north side of town works better for you, you, you probably would have a choice on that, that kind of thing. So check it out. Sign up for Rooted. There is a cost involved. This book is $20, and you would, you would purchase that since it becomes yours, and you're writing in it about your experiences and stuff. So 
encourage you to, uh, to participate in Rooted. And then secondly, I uh, want to uh, mention this little brochure we've got around uh, the church now. This is about our grief share ministry. And uh, maybe this is kind of where you are in life right now, that you've lost a loved one or there's been a trauma in your family that uh, you want to join a group to kind of uh, help along with that. Uh, people that I know who have gone through Grief Share talk about how incredibly healthy uh, it was uh, to, to learn how to grieve properly and to find God's presence in the midst of the suffering and things like that. So Grief Share, you can grab one of these. You can always go to our, our website and find out more information about Grief Share. But the fall semester for Grief Share starts August 16. And then finally, I just always want to say thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Uh, you can uh, give at firstdenton.church, firstdenton.org. You can text amounts to the church. Uh, if you want to do uh, put pen to paper, you can write a, uh, write a check out to the, to the church, leave it in one of our collection boxes along the way. But it's because of your faithful giving that we're able to send teams to Puerto Rico and teams to Africa and folks right across the street too. So God bless you for that. We want to thank you for coming today. Did I, did I skip anything? We got everything good. So two things left to do. The first one is stand up. I guess you know what the second one is. Leave. See you next time. God bless. Love you.